for disease, injures the glomerulus and causes inflammation of the um, glomerulus that ends up into the glomerular nephritis. And our medical management is usually symptomatic and it depends on the severity of the disease. Um, with, with this, you know they're going to have uh, increased potassium because they're not excreting the potassium in the urine, right? So you want to uh, monitor the lab, the lab values and electrolytes. Okay, with chronic, you, uh, most of the nephrons are damaged or lost by the time they've um, gotten into the chronic phase. And um, they're going to have abnormal lateral values uh, with protein in the urine, um, specific gravity, um, cast in the urine because it's, it's crystallized. And, and um, the kidneys uh, will begin to atrophy with chronic glomerular nephritis. And you're going to notice um, decreased filtration of, of the blood. So it's going to start with accumulation of waste products in the bloodstream. Um, Kidneys will shrink in size, so on scan you'll probably notice that um, the kidneys are small on the x-ray, and uh, you're going to have an increased serum and creatinine level. Um, changes in the color of the urine is going to be reddish-brown, tea-colored urine, um, dish urine, urine with odor, because you know they're having um, de decrease in urine, so any, any time you have that decrease in concentrated urine, you know the urine is going to be darker. And um, sometimes this can develop with mild to moderate hypertension. Um, patients will tell you they've had weight loss, they may feel weak, um, they're getting up, having to urinate a lot at night. Um, they'll probably be pale due to the anemia, so um, getting a CDC on labs is important. And sometimes they may even need a um, blood transfusion. And um, the fluid overload is going to have pa patients with renal failure. You'll notice um, uh, distended neck veins or crackles on respirations, and um, even a um, S1 gap when you're listening to the heart sounds. Those are all signs of fluid overload. Um, You want to assess their filtration rate, um, and, and usually um, the filtration rate is a good indicator of the kidney kidney function. And like I said earlier, um, GFR rate goes in five different stages. So as you see, by the time you reach stage five, they're in end stage renal. But um, when you're assessing the creatinine levels along with this. That'll kind of give them a better indicator of how far the kidney failure is going because um, um, creatinine levels are increasing along as the GFR is decreasing. Um, GFR is the amount of plasma filtered to the glomeruli, and um, the creatinine clearance is the measure of the, the creatinine in the kidney. So, a good uh, test to take to measure kidney function will be a 24 hour urine. And um, that's the best indicator to um, assess how poor the kidney function is for this patient. Um, as creatinine increases, you'll start to see metabolic acidosis and abnormal calcium and phosphorus levels. And uh, like I said, the fluid retention, edema from the CHF, and so that's why you want to hear the um, crackling in the lungs. Um, the electrolytes will be imbalanced. And, um, um, the hypertension will become hard to control. And the risk factors is any cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes is the primary cause of chronic kidney disease. Um, and it's a uh, leading cause that patients start renal replacement. Hypertension, um, Hypertension over time will cause a patient to get into renal failure, and it's usually the number one indicator when it, they have uncontrolled hypertension over time or just a patient that's non-compliant. Um, they're always more than likely going to end, end up in um, kidney failure. <coughs> and um, you want to teach these patients on sodium and water restriction. 
Um, use of them is, like I said, for the hypertension and the antidiuretics. Um, daily weight monitoring, especially for patients with CHL. And um, that's going to include proteins of high biologic value, like dairy products and eggs and meat, and uh, maintaining calories. But you're trying, to, you're trying to stop this renal failure from progressing and getting any further because you can correct renal failure if you catch it early. But if, if you don't, they're going to end up needing dialysis. Can you say that again? You want them to eat eggs? Uh huh. Uh -huh. So, high Uh huh. And, like I said, um, on x ray, the kidneys are going to look small. Um, and you want to try to get the um, underlying cause of uh, the kidney loss. Uh, CT scans without contrast. <laughs> yeah, they can't filter that contrast out, so you don't want to want them to get a um, CT that that they have dying with me and uh, KUV. And sometimes um, those KUVs also help you find any obstructions that are going on in the kid. Okay, acute renal failure. Um, we have signs of hypovolemia, hypotension, and you know, you know if you're having a hypovolemia, they're having a decreased perfusion. Um, they may have an obstruction of renal arteries or veins, or obstruction of the um, kidneys or lower urinary tract. And this can all develop as a result of kidney stones also. Um, decreased perfusion to the kidneys can damage the kidneys, and, and that's coming from obstruction and decreased urinary flow. And um, like I said, you're going to have an increase in creatinine. Um, usually, kidney failure results when a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters of mercury has been sustained over time. And um, the oliguria is a sign of this with a decreased urinary output. And uh, anytime they have an um, renal failure, they're going to start showing signs of uh, uremia or uh, azotemia. So what kind of signs would you expect from that? Because they're not filtered. The kids is not filtering it out. Mm -hmm. Blood mm -hmm. yeah. they, they, they keep it in all this waste in their body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but they gonna they probably have like itchy skin, pruritus stuff because all that waste is still in them. Mm -hmm. So signs of a uh, uremia or azotemia may occur. That's when you might see little um, the skin getting real dry and white because that's all the, the waste accumulating in the body. Mm -hmm. That was he much better. Jesus, take the car. And this just to um, <laughs> break down how the acute um, renal failure, rapid loss of renal function due to damage of the kidneys, and the signs and symptoms are the um, decreased urinary output, increased flattening, and fluid and left like imbalance is going to always occur like um, elevated potassium levels because they're not excreting the potassium out. Um, caused by conditions that reduce the blood flow, and that's like a, I said, the um, high blood pressure, you know. The, the body is not getting perfused with high blood pressure, so therefore the kidneys are getting perfused, and that's why it's going to lead to issues with uh, renal failure. And patients with diabetes, uh, diabetes starts killing the nerve endings with a high um, buildup of glucose, and that's why a lot of times they end up in um, renal failure as well. And we talk about obstruction of the kidney on the urethra lower urinary tract by a tumor or stones, um, bilateral obstruction of the renal arteries or veins, and uh, if the conditions aren't corrected, it can lead to permanent damage of the kidneys. But um, like I said, uh, acute failure can be reversed if you catch it early. Um, chronic is a progressive irreversible deterioration of renal function, and that's where I talk about the um, uremia and azotemia and you're going to have to increase the DNA and creatinine. Um, and renal function declines and the end, end products of waste build up in the blood. And that's, like I said, you want to see the signs of the uremia. And 
these just some um, nursing interventions. Um, you, that's hitting the thing with a chronic patient having an accumulation of fluid. They're not getting the fluid out. So um, you want to assess for hitting the thing with these patients. Any signs of fluid overload, like I said, um, they may have difficulty breathing, uh, neck vein distensions from fluid overload. So um, this, this is constant ongoing of making sure you monitor urinary output. I had a, um, a CNA one time that um, she was requiring urinary output on, on my patient that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, it was in renal failure. So we ended up having to um, send that patient for emergency dialysis because we didn't, we didn't know they was in, ur in urinary failure. So it's important to maintain accurate diagnosis on your patient. And uh, this is just an overview of a patient they may end up having to um, get dialysis once they're in uh, renal failure. And um, dialysis is, um, has a big impact on a patient's quality of life because you know they're probably having to go three times a week and um, they're going to have to end up getting a, a, a um, AV graft that's connecting a big blood vessel. And so their chances of a hypertension in increases when they're getting stuff like hemodialysis because they have to take a vein and connect it to a major artery in order to filter out the, the um, blood and you know, cleanse it and bring it back into the body. So it, it causes a lot on the patient. And, um, you want to constantly monitor patients that's on hemodialysis for any kind of um, excess fluid volume or um, imbalance because when they pull it so much off, sometimes it'll cause a disequilibrium with the patients and they can be, become confused. And uh, it's a good note to tell the patients to um, have a little small snack or something before you go through dialysis. And um, just potential complications that go along with the renal failure, like we said, the uh, hyperkalemia. Uh, renal failure can affect any part of the body. The pericarditis, that's uh, inflammation of, of the heart because um, you're not getting the waste products out. So anytime those waste products are staying in your system, it's going to affect any system um, that you have in your body. The anemia is coming from the decreased perfusion and uh, decreased production of the red blood cells. So sometimes these patients might require blood transfusion. And um, that's just a brief overview of uh, urinary tract cancers. But back to the fluid volume overload, um, what, is, what are some things you want to go over before um, with a patient that's having fluid overload, some interventions you would want to do? Yeah, increase sodium intake. And then what they're drinking. Uh -huh. Decreased fluid intake. <coughs> well, you can, you can elevate, but you're trying to prevent your damage. You want to prevent it? Mm -hmm. If they can get up and ambulate, yeah, that's not one because you don't have relation. It gets that fluid movement and gets it off of constant urination. They feed foods and adjust. Uh -huh, limit, limit their, their potassium if they have hyperkalemia and uh, any, restrict, any diet restrictions that could be um, interfering with their renal functions. You want to go over all of that with your patients. Um, the urinary tract cancers, these are just a brief overview. Um, you know, um, tobacco use is the leading cause of uh, bladder cancer and um, combined with the prostate cancer more common in um, people over age 55, and you'll probably start seeing a lot of uh, issues with prostate cancer in men after the age of 65 years. Um, and, and sometimes um, when it gets to that point, like with the prostate cancer, it's a, it's a slow, slow cancer, so they can just uh, sit and watch for that. But if they start having any kind of signs and symptoms, then they want to seek um, treatment. <coughs> Um, uh, symptom is pain is hematuria. You know, a lot of times with cancers, it's not going to be pain. So um, if you start seeing um, changes in body or um, hematuria, pelvic or back pain, then you want to 
go ahead and further test that patient to see if for issues like that. And um, treatment for this usually is surgical, they end up with those kind of cancers where they might have to go in and remove um, the bladder. And that's just a basic breakdown of the um, kidney cancer telling you the incidence is higher um, with the increased BMI. So you want to um, go to patients with um, sometimes weight loss can help decrease their risk. And um, signs and symptoms of being a hematuria, brain pain. And um, a lot of times a, a, hit, a family history increases the risk for this as well. <coughs> Um, these are just some antibiotics to go over um, as far as the patients that probably have um, like the cystitis and um, polynephritis if they ever have to take for um with pregnant women would you think it's okay for them to take sulfur, sulfur products because in pregnant women uh, sulfur products can cause injury or harm to the child and uh, any time a patient's taking any kind of antibiotics or stuff, if you want to um, go over any kind of allergies with them, like, because um, some, some allergic reactions can be hives, um, rashes. Um, sometimes it can increase their, uh, I mean, decrease their platelet count. So if they have a decreased platelet, they're going to have a higher chance of eating. Yeah. So, um, any time they're getting um, therapy with any kind of medication, you want to go over that with them as well. Um, with the trimethoprim, um, that's, that's usually taken for um, bacterial uh, UTI and um, also the side effects of that is going to be rash colitis and nausea and vomiting. And um, you want to go over drug allergies with them with that. And also have them um, increase their fluid intake to flush this out of the system because it's an accumulation of these drugs that's getting in their bladder. Go to sleep. And um, this is just another overview of the um, supplements and the trimethoprim. Um, they can be used in combination, and it uh, usually blocks the synthesis of the cell metabolism and also uh, it's decreasing the chance of the bacteria. Um, it's used for issues like the UTI, dentritis, and wound infections, and um, treatment and vacuum cetera. Anybody ever had to take any of these? Mm -hmm. these, these can be a real nasty drug, so you want to make sure you're telling the patient to um, drink plenty of fluids because any kind of cum accumulation of these can cause toxicity in the body. And um, side effects is the nausea, vomiting, and photosensitivity. So if they have photosensitivity, what you want to tell them? Yeah. And, um, a test for signs of kidney dysfunction and uh, monitor EKGs because why are you monitoring the EKG? Because the potassium level is going to gonna make them have some arrhythmias. And uh, preventing infection and monitor for signs and symptoms of any kind of infection. So, can you tell your kidney monitor for clot? <coughs> Is clotting a problem with kidney failure? Most of the kidney failure probably have um, increased clotting because they're not they're, they're not producing red blood cells to create the clotting factor, so they'll have an increased risk of bleeding. And you'll probably notice they have a lot of bruises and more instead of um, problems with the clotting. Okay. urinary tract infection and I'm just kind of read it out and give you an overview and, you, and then we'll start discussing it. Um, you are working in an extended care facility um, when when Mrs. Z's daughter brings her mother in for a week stay while she goes on vacation and Mrs. Z is an 89 year old widow 
with a four day history of dysuria, super pubic pain, incontinence, new onset mental confusion, and low stools. You know how we talked about the mental confusion with the older people? And her most current vital signs are 118 over 60, 88, respirations 18, and temp 994. Um, the medical doctor orders a post forward catheterization, which yielded 100 cc's of cloudy urine that had a strong odor and several lab tests on admission. So the results of her lab, she had a BUN of 25, mm -hmm. sodium 131, potassium 3.2, and a white blood cell of 11,000. UTI. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, her urinalysis her, um, is cloudy with odor, pH is 6.9, and it's negative for protein. But um, white blood cells, she has six white blood cells. So, okay, I'm going to the question. What condition do the assessment findings and lab reports point toward? Urinary with her, with her, With her symptoms, the history of dysuria, mm -hmm. Incontinence and super pubic pain. Um, she has an odor to the urine, urine and elevated pH. Presence of nitrites and white blood cells in the urine, elevated WBCs. And what does that point to? Mm -hmm. UTI. A UTI. So what you want to do for UTI? You want to do increased fluids, antibiotics, and antibiotics, mm -hmm. increased fluids. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we are having an elevated BUN. Mm -hmm. What's that kind of indicative of? Kidney. Kidney. Or an older patient. What what I said, the number one thing that probably leads a patient to any kind of thing with renal failure, kidney stones, calcium, UTIs, it's going to be hydration. Oh, shucks. Okay. So more than likely, she's dehydrated, okay? Okay, the medical director makes rounds and starts um, D5 and a half, 75, and starts the follow the gravity. And because MZ is unable to take oral meds, the medical director orders CIPRO 400 IV kitty bag. It's the type of fluid in the rate for MZ age condition. Is it right for her age and her condition? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you are just teaching her about hygiene. You want you want to give her the fluid to to stimulate her urination. So so giving her the antibody with that fluid is okay for her. And um, she 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 needs to um get the D five and a half because is she having a little confusion and uh, a little sugar would just help stimulate that with her because she's probably having a low nutritional intake also. Um, and, and D5 and half is okay if a patient was having um, had a history of diabetes. Would you want to give them D5 and half? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. While administering IV piggyback ciprofloxacin, what adverse effects might occur? You have hypotension, headache, drowsiness, restlessness, nausea, or tendon rupture. Hypotension, headache, drowsiness, you pick all that apply that may occur while you're giving um, Cipro. That could be some side effects of this. Hypertension, headache, drowsiness, restless, restlessness, nausea, or tendon rub. Give me some ideas. Come on, throw some out. <laughs> Yes, you can have some headaches, some restless, restless, nausea, vomiting. So if they have any signs and symptoms, what would you want to do? You would just continue. Yeah, just continue to sit pro and um, let the doctor know, and he probably want to change it to something else. She's probably getting toxicity with this because if she's had not putting it out, it's accumulating in her system. And you know, in her age, she's having decreased urinary output and low, decreased uh, renal function.
Okay, this is one for acute urinary retention. Um, you're working in the emergency department when a 72-year-old man enters with a chief complaint of inability to void and his initial vital signs are 168 or 92, pulse 88, respiration 20 with a temp of 98.2. Does he got high blood pressure? What you saying? 168 over 92. So, um, are his vital signs appropriate for his age and if not offer a rationale of his abnormal rating? You were kind of on track with it. He, 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 he was slightly elevated. And, it's, and um, sometimes with elevation, this patient's in urinary retention, and what would be causing his um, elevation with the blood pressure and slightly in the pulse? Not being able to filter. When, they're, when they're having a lot of pain, you'll, you'll see a tendency of the blood pressure okay. and um, pulse rates to be elevated. Okay, his, um, Mr. given Ms. MB's chief complaint, what would you expect to find during initial assessment? A distended bladder on palpation, elevated BP, diaphoresis, agitation and restlessness, discomfort, pain. Distended bladder. Distended bladder. Distended bladder. Because he's having urinary retention and that's causing him the pain, so that's why he's having the elevated blood pressure and pulse. And so with, um, with urinary retention, they have a higher tendency to develop the UTIs because they have the stasis of urine, right? So even more, that's why you want to increase the urinary output and get them to um, drink more fluids. Kidney stones. Her past medical history includes three kidney stone attacks all during late summer. And uh, what did we say was one of the high risk factors for dehydration? dehydration. She's 18. And one of the high risk factors for recurring kidney stones would be Yeah, by the age of 25. So um, this is saying her past medical history includes three kidney stone attacks all during the late summer. Uh, it sounds fine or that her abdomen is soft without tenderness, but her left flank is extremely tender to the touch, palpation and percussion, um, and you place her in one of the exam rooms. <coughs> her vital signs are 188 over 98, pulse is 90, and why is that? We just discussed that. She's, she's in a lot of pain. Um, a body gear analysis shows an RBC of 50 to 100, and a white blood cells are zero. So RBCs in her urine is indicating and what's the name for, for blood in the urine? Hematuria. And if she has that stone that's causing that friction, that, that's probably why you see blood in her urine, right? Okay, let's see. What could be the cause of blood in her urine? 
Kitty's still moving. Look, a tree. So uh, well, you, would, you, would, you do like a, a urinary CT. KUB, CT. Mm -hmm. Okay, it says the presence of RBCs in the urine can indicate renal injury or infection, renal obstruction, or bladder infection. Um, some, some, some causes you should consider um, <coughs> for an 18-year-old that has blood in the urine, could, you need to exclude this first. Some some reasons some reasons that she may have blood in her urine. She's young. And, and you oh, wanna, you need to make sure she's not on the period. Yeah, you want to you want to go over third history with her because um, her if, if it's that it could just be as simple as that. <laughs> and a uh, straight catheterization can be performed to collect the blood in urine, especially to verify the results. Okay. Okay. The physician orders a IV polygram. What questions do you need to ask? before the test is conducted. Allergies. What blood test do you need to check for? Um, you and have and have you Come on, thank y'all. Mm -hmm. You just said it, allergies. Mm -hmm. If she has any um, allergic reaction to what specifically? Iodine. Oh, yeah, yeah. shellfish, iodine, IDP <laughs> dye. Is she a diabetic? Um, a serum creatinine BUN might be drawn to check for renal function before the test. And um, if she if she could be pregnant. Mm -hmm. Okay. She states she had an allergic reaction during her last IVP and was and was instructed don't let anyone give her dye for any testing. So the physician counsels that what all type of tests can be done? Ultrasound. Okay, now we said it says the the non the non contrast CT scan shows a left two millimeter urethral vesicle junction stone. What are the most what are the two most common types of stones? The 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 S. The the most common type of stone oh, is No. Calcium. Calcium. Well, calcium oscillate. Uh huh. Calcium. calcium and uritic acid. And a form of calcium oscillate or calcium phosphate. And that's the most common. And struvite is the second most. Which is the and uritic acid, right? Mm -hmm. And who do we say um, mainly gets the struvite? Women. Women. Okay. What is the most likely cause of her stones? <coughs> her age or her his past medical history. The highest indication, the highest risk for developing stones. I think it's her dehydration, dehydration from dehydration. being out in the sun. Dehydration comes with she says. She doesn't take water. She don't drink. And they always happen in late and, summer. And mainly dehydration is the number one cause sometimes that people want to develop stones, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And identify two methods of treating a patient with a urethral vesicle junction stone. What we said a conservative option is most patients are going to go home and drink lots of fluids, fluids. Uh -huh. and, and, and strain their urine, mm -hmm. right? And increase their fluid intake. Okay, and what are some um, diet diet? Therapies you can go with her. Low purine. Low purine. Low purine. Low protein. Low phosphate. Mm -hmm. um, but calcium. Oh. Mm -hmm. Because because hers is calcium. Oh, okay. Um, Lymphotrexate can be used to break the stone into smaller fragments that can that can be passed through the urine. But we say usually you're going to start advancing to something like that if they haven't passed that stone and one or two months or the pain is just getting uh, unbearable and they can't take it anymore so they're going to pro progress to some kind of surgical interventions. Kind of Minimal invasive surgical procedures <coughs> to remove the stone will be placed with a stent. And so if they have stents, what you're going to always see um, with stents in their urine. Blood. Blood. Yeah, you're going to keep seeing blood in the urine until the stents are removed. The more aggressive option is to admit, 
to the hospital and scared her for so she won't remove all the stone. And you know, we're not gonna do that from the start. Okay. Now she's discharged with instructions to, to sprain all urine and return if she experiences pain unrelieved by pain medication or increased nausea and bones. So what specific instructions will you give her about urine, fluid intake, medications, and activity? Increase your fluid. Increase our fluids to what? Two, three, three to four. Three to four. Three to four liters a day. Okay. Okay. She should understand that this is primary method of flushing the stone from the urinary tract and keep a written record of it. She only keeps a written record of what she's taking in and out. Um, it says, however, if she has a complete blockage of the ear to where hydrogenophorosis occurring, this increase in fluid intake will be contraindicated because you're exhausting the ureters and expanding it more. Mm -hmm. And if you expand the ureters more, you, you don't have that push to get anything out. Um, we said she's going to be instructed to keep all her stones and inform the urologist um, about examining the stone. Um, it's compliance, compliance with such instructions can be increased when you have the patient set simple achievable achievable goals. So you want to give her goals to set for herself when increasing her um, fluid intake and that's even after after this is over. Because she keeps getting these so she definitely needs some education on how to prevent herself from getting these stones. Um, what what kind of other activity can help move the stone along that we talked about? Mobility Okay, so ambulation might facilitate the movement of the stone through the urinary tract. And um, what kind of pain medications can help toward her with the pain? <laughs> Instead, and uh, opioids, but you know, um, increased opioid intake can also cause other issues. So, what you want to teach her about that? Increase fluids. <laughs> I don't think it's okay. Because she got a higher risk of developing. Constipation. Constipation. So mobilization and uh, increase of her fluid intake is going to help her help help prevent that. Okay, she returns in the ED in six hours with complaints of pain relieved by pain medication and increased blood in the urine. And uh, she's been held in the ED until transport to surgery. What is your immediate plan of care if she's going to go on to surgery to remove it? NPL. Oh, good deal, too. Mm -hmm. So you want to maintain her NPO. Also, what else? If she's NPO, she has a stone. And what we said, if they can't get it by mouth, IV, IV, IV they can be starting IV and push fluids through the IV. Um, and continue to strain all her urine and maintain her safety. Okay. A two millimeter catheter was removed by the extraction. And pathologic, pathologic examination reported the stone to be calcium oxalate. If, if SR continues to form stones, what recommendations would the fit physician make? Decrease your calcium. Increase? Decrease. 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 Okay. But what we want to, what we say, uh, change the diet. What, what do we say is a, um, is the best Overview for a urine collection. 24, 24 hours. Hour, 24 hour urine. Hour urine. So you want to obtain a 24 hour urine collection for the stone because you're trying to assess it, and that's the best way to do the assessment so you can educate this patient on what's needed to try to prevent this from happening again. Um, let's see, check her PTH levels because PTH levels allows um, the release of calcium in the blood. So, you know, that, that could be an issue that's going on with her also that the doctor needs to assess. Um, refer her to a nephrologist and um, just continue to monitor her for accumulation of stones. Okay, now here we go. Now, now that SR stone has been reported as calcium oxalate, she is referred to a <laughs> dietitian for guidance on diet that will prevent further development of the stones 
and which statements are true regarding recommendations. Um, decrease animal protein intake, avoid eating organ meats, poultry, fish, <coughs> gravies, red wine, and sardines, avoid spinach, black tea, coffee, chocolate, beets, um, decrease sodium intake, and drink at least three to four liters of water a day. The first three. Sure. Um, Would she decrease the animal protein? Yes. She has calcium. Purses of calcium. So the animal protein is more decreased with the ones with the um, uric acid and, and the um, oxidants. Like a Mm-hmm. Exactly what it is. Um, so do you want to tell her to avoid spinach and black tea, coffee, chocolate, beets, wheat, bread, and nuts? Um, and definitely increase her fluids three to four liters a day. Mm -hmm. And um, the rationale is decreasing animal protein intake is recommended for those with uric acid or cysteine in stomach. Avoiding argan meats, poultry, fish, gravies, red wine, and sardines is recommended for those with uric acid. Mm -hmm. um, decreasing sodium <laughs> intake is helpful for those with calcium oxalate stones because high sodium intake reduces the renal tubal absorption. And um, oxalates are found in foods such as spinach, black tea, coffee. So that's why you want to tell her to avoid those. So what's somebody supposed to eat if they have both of those? Ice chips. Type 2 diabetes that a comorbid existence of a disease that comes to the ED. He has severe right flank pain and abdominal pain with nausea and vomiting. The abdomen is soft and without tenderness. Uh, right flank pain is extremely tender to touch and to palpation. His vital signs are 142 over 80, pulse 88, respiration 20 with a temp of 99. Um, UA shows hematuria. An IV of normal saline is started at set to infuse at 125. And the IV confirms the diagnosis of staghorn type stone and the right renal pelvis. The right kidney looks enlarged and um, states he did not sleep well last night and has, hasn't eaten much. Um, he's fatigued and his lab, lab results are listed below. So he has a sodium of 144 in the equivalent. A potassium of 4.0, BUN is 30, creatinine is 3.6, um, uric acid is 5.0, calcium is 9.0 milligrams. I'm just trying to find all the abnormal. His LDH total is 100 units and cholesterol is 200. And his albumin is 4.0 grams per deciliter. So, um, Okay, overall, the overall results are within normal limits except for the creatinine and BUN um, glucose levels. His glucose level is 260 and he does have a history of diabetes. The elevated creatinine and BUN might reflect renal damage and dehydration. And, um, and, and you know he's been uh, having a lot of nausea and vomiting so his um, risk of dehyd dehydration is increased. And uh, like I said, the elevated glucose is related to the diabetes, the stress will cause that also. Analyze the relationship between creatinine and GFR um, prediction of kidney function. 
So what do that, what we talked about about the create name and GFR rate? GFR is with, with kidney function. It's going it down. Decrease, it. decrease GFR, increase creatinine. Yeah, yeah, because. Creatinine is constantly released by the muscles, so you're going to have an increase in creatinine. Um, the glomerulus is intact now from with clear creatinine from the body as it is produced. Um, and sometimes that <coughs> might be constant, but if the GFR decreases, the cell creatinine level will increase. Okay, creatinine concentration or creatinine clearance can be used to indicate change. And glomerular function. An equation uses sound creatinine to estimate the GFR, and spot urine albumin have replaced the 24 hour um, urine specimen collection. So it's telling you that um, with the sound creatinine levels <coughs> and the GFR and the albumin to creatinine ratio, sometimes the doctor can assess that now and it kind of gives him a better indicator of the kidney function than the 24 hour urine. <laughs> okay, he's um, paying his student <coughs> ID marking. It's late in the afternoon before he's admitted to the unit, and he's scheduled for lipid trips in the morning. What specific priorities do you identify? What's priorities for the patient um, with renal calculi? He's going to be going for lipid trips. And so, what's your what's your priority with this patient? Priority nursing consideration is going to surgery because he's going to be here, right? Get your form signed. He's going to be pain management. He's going to be in a lot of pain. Okay, control his glucose levels because you know he has a history of diabetes. Um, what else? Facilitate his sleep because you know he did report fatigue. Monitor his H and H. If he's losing a lot of blood in his urine, so we want to monitor his urine also. Um, monitor his fluid status. And um, um, if he's going to be going to surgery, he's in PO, he's probably going to need IV fluids because you know he's already dehydrated. That's why he has the elevated BUN and creatinine. Okay, what problems can result as a um, occurrence with these stones? Acute renal failure? Yeah. If, if this is not corrected, he can end up in, in acute renal failure. And what else? Sepsis. Sepsis. Yeah. Chronic infection, um, renal pelvic obstruction. <coughs> and uh, we said obstruction is um, in an emergent situation. So, what are signs that it may be an obstruction complete? No, 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 the physician has ordered garamycin, IV piggyback, and divided doses over eight hours. Okay. Later, as you walk past his bed, you notice him falling off the end of the bed. So what are some interventions? Because he, he's, he's kind of getting confused. Moving closer to the nursing station. He's, see, he's, he's older. He's been getting um, IV antibiotics. Sometimes these IV, uh, IV antibiotics will accumulate because he's in real failure. He's not getting this out of his system, so he's having increased perfusion. So um, your nursing priority for this patient. Safety. Safety. So um, you want to elevate his side rails up. Mm -hmm. Bed alarm. Keep them oriented. Take them to the bathroom. Up, use a bed alarm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. 